Hello, this is Will Lucas. Welcome to my video blog, Surfing with Cancer, my second Vietnam. This is the ninth in a series based on letters written home from Vietnam. Company C, 4th Engineering Battalion, 4th Infantry Division, had arrived in Vietnam in July 1966 after a three and a half week ocean crossing. After months of work, we had built a functioning Dragon Mountain base camp for use by an influx of new troops. In February 1967, we moved out to Dao Tiang in the southern part of the country. We were now serving in support of the 25th Infantry. That experience was unsettling in many ways. Reading my letters for the month, one might think I was on vacation just having fun. But by this time, I had learned to leave out most of the bad stuff. I knew my parents, especially my mother, had great concern for my safety. And I wasn't alone in this area. A fellow engineer from D Company, Melvin Pope, in a recent correspondence wrote, When my mother gave my daughter my letters, she told her she would see what a liar I was. I don't think I was lying, just withholding the truth. Mom said she could read between the lines. Now, after 50 years in reading these letters, I'm reading between the lines. Most time, I was writing as fast as I could, so my penmanship was terrible. I didn't write home too much about the bad things happening. When I told her it was getting cold at night, she wanted to send me clothes. When I told her I mashed my fingers unloading barrels of tar, she told me to take off work until it got better. Friends and family told me she wasn't eating right and worried too much, so I would write jokingly, adding a lot of nonsense. The TV news and newspapers back home were having a field day with what was going on in Vietnam, and the deaths of my schoolmates and friends didn't help matters. War sucked, but I was an optimist. In spite of everything going on around me, I concentrated on one thing, surfing in Hawaii. My planned R&R &R to Hawaii had been canceled for the second time, but this month it was going to happen. As evidenced by my letters, thoughts of getting back on a surfboard was the primary thing that kept me going. Letter, 4 March, 1967. Hawaii, the 21st. This means good steaks, real milk, no tent, no living in dust, civilian clothes, real American people, cars, everything. Nothing will stop me from going this time. How about sending me a couple of the pictures I took? Oh, by the way, what was in the package you got from me? You can expect two more. I sent two speakers and an amplifier. I hope they make it home fairly decent shape. Only four months left over here. Yay! This place is worse than play coup. Only one thing that has in its favor, the swimming pool. I, well, I'm leaving for Hawaii on the 21st. No matter what, I'll be there. As soon as I get my orders, I'll give you all the info on what flight I'll be taking and all that. I hope that you will still be able to make it. You know, when I get back from r and I'll only have three months left in this hole. Well, enough for now. Dao Chang was so much different than Play Coup. In addition to the stress of the move, I missed the friendship of my best buddy Lanny Houtman, who stayed behind in Play Coup. He was transferred to another company where he continued to operate a flamethrower. Fortunately, I was also close to Rick Meyer and Mike Twig. Our company commander in play coup, Captain Sanchez, had also remained behind, and now we reported to a new CO, who was very much a no-nonsense guy. He took away most of our free time, but I still managed to get to the pool every opportunity I got. Hi, I had only one letter from you with my due address, so far, this mail has kind of messed up ever since we got down here. I haven't heard anything or whether or not Peg will be coming. I realize she has to take time off school and work, which makes it just about as difficult for her as it is for myself. On March 12, 1967, our new CO had ordered men to clear an open area down the road from our camp. The trucks encountered problems right away. Fellow engineer Charlie Rowland was unloading sandbags when a truck driven by Larry Fox pulled up next to him, exploding a mine and leaving Charlie with a butt full of shrapnel. Joey Papone was in his Jeep just behind the incident, but was not injured. Both guys described a scene with Charlie running around screaming that his butt burned. When he dropped his drawers and saw blood, he was hoping for sympathy, but instead became the victim of a barrage of laughter. 
the mission was canceled. But I was oblivious to my surroundings, preoccupied with building a new combo hut while dreaming of surfing again. I finally had my papers confirming my trip to Hawaii. A few days before leaving, I pulled all night duty with Spec 5 Ray Knight, who had just returned from Hawaii. Charlie Rowland, who had just been injured, loaned Ray money so he could afford to secretly fly stateside to see his wife and his new baby for the first time. Ray and I talked for hours about his experience, unconcerned about the threats around us. It was Ray's night. I'll never forget the excitement he expressed as he described seeing his wife and baby. He pronounced his love for his family. He was enamored with being a father. He also wanted badly to go home. And while I was hoping to learn about Hawaii, he taught me something so much greater, a lesson of gratitude that has followed me throughout my lifetime. A couple of days later, it was finally my turn to escape, and suddenly, there I was in Hawaii with my fellow engineer and travel partner, Mike Egan. Miraculously, my sister arrived within a few hours of my flight. She brought my dad's 8mm movie camera, and we documented some of our travels. Letter, postmark 25, March 1967. Hi, been mostly sightseeing since we got here. We must have already seen everything on the island. We may go to another, I don't know. Postcard dated 426, 1967 from Hawaii to my friend Mike Dwyer. Hi Mike, got here on the 21st. So far, only been on the board twice. Been all over the island, I'll write more. While the trip was wonderful, it also had its problems. Peg and I made the mistake of going into a bar in Honolulu where looking like a military person was a bad thing. I was sitting across from my sister when a drunk came up to the table and started harassing her, telling my sister how hot she was. As I put my hands on the table to stand, he hit me with an uppercut, knocking me over the bench onto the floor. I chased him out of the bar, and before I knew it, I was lifted in the air by two huge men. My sister pleaded with them, telling them that I was there on leave from Vietnam. They gently put me down, warning me, never touch Hawaiian. They immediately turned to my assailant and beat the hell out of him. Well, today is the 29th. We arrived in Saigon yesterday afternoon. We got back to the base camp this morning. After being in Hawaii a week, this place looks worse than ever. Already, they're hounding me about getting a haircut. Today marks at the maximum 100 days till I get home. It can be any time before that. Probably leave base camp around June 30th. I'm going to try for another r and in May. I think I want to go somewhere like Japan or China. I don't know right now. I really enjoyed myself in Hawaii and it was great to see Peg again. I met a lot of people working there from Maryland and TC. I'd like to go back to Hawaii someday. When I go, I want to have my scuba tank along with me because the water looks great for diving. I went surfing three times while I was there. I even got Peg to try it once. She did get sunburned. I hope she's over it by now. Well, I've got to get some other letters off, so bye for now. Before leaving for my trip back to Dao Tang, I gave my sister my new Petri camera and $200, suggesting she stay for a little while longer. She wrote her boss a letter of resignation, adopted the Hawaiian lifestyle, and eventually gave birth to Hawaiian twins. They were my excuse for returning to the islands in 1968. But the excitement about the trip will be forever marred. Interestingly, my letter did not mention the tragedy that occurred while I was off living my dream. My friends Mike Twig and Ray Knight, as well as Sergeant Lloyd McBroom, had been killed while out on a minesweeping operation.
The tragedy continued at home as well for all the families. In Ray Knight's case, his niece contacted me many years ago. Although she was too young to have known Ray, she expressed her love and concern. She was seeking information, but gave me more than I was able to give her. Within a couple of years of Ray's death, his wife was out of the scene. Grandparents took over the care of the small child. At age 13, he took to the streets never to be heard from again. Please know, my son, if you are out there listening, many of your dad's Vietnam brothers know just how much you are loved. Like four Andrews, I'm uh, proud to be able to be here today to pay tribute to our three corner brothers that we lost. We'll never forget them. Ron Gray, uh, I was E5 specialist. Uh, I was a combat engineer, and uh, this is my third time at this wall. And uh, it just doesn't get easy. It's still tough coming here. Yeah. Uh, we're here today with a group of engineers who were with them when they were killed in action 50 years. They will always be remembered and they're in our hearts forever. Love you all. So, Charlie Rowan, I'm with 4th Combat Engineers. The first time I came here, I, I couldn't even come down in this valley. I couldn't even, I started shaking and stuff like that. But, this is the most I've ever been with with my brothers. It's, I, I, it's just great. I miss you guys. I love you. Jack Bassioni from Charlie Company, 4th Engineers. Uh, truck driver over there. Worked with these fellas alongside them. So 50 years later, it's hard to believe. John Patella, Specialist 4th Class, 4th Infantry Division, 4th Engineers, Charlie Company, 1965 to 1967. Lieutenant Petrie, the platoon leader, what my job was, was whatever they told me to do. Oh man, I thought we were the best. Uh, that company I was so proud of. The best disciplined, uh, I, you know, I still remember when we first got here, how we had to really take care of ourselves. And then when the infantry got there, you know, the difference between us and them, I thought. You're being an engineer, you had to be yeah. with it, you had to be smarter. I thought we were a good bunch. We, uh, we had the sergeants were great, the, everybody was good. But we had absolutely no problems, as I remember. And all the work we had to do and the jobs we had to do, we did them. We all had to change the yeah. okay. And we were there by ourselves, you know, yeah. for a long time until the infantry came. Yeah, I talked to a bunch of guys and didn't volunteer. <laughs> well, people don't realize that we were there before the infantry was in. Yeah, yeah. Right. We were advanced party. And I remember, you know, like, and, uh, history books don't report that correctly. Yeah, I know they don't. And I remember the, the thing that I think I might have said last night was the perimeter, you know, we had the perimeter of the camp. So we guarded ourselves after exactly. that first air cap, first guy, they left. And I don't remember there were no shots fired. That's right. But I, I was to me, scared that, shitless at night. Though. But, but, but that was discipline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it was, I remember when the infantry came a couple of nights, they just shot up everything. Yeah. Um, but we held our fire. You know, we, were, we knew what to do.